Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. I'm excited to share with you this morning because I believe that the Lord has dropped something in my heart that will explain to some of you, maybe many of you, why it is that you're still battling some things. Because if you feel like there is something in your life that you just can't get on top of, that you can't rise above, that it's a constant fight for you and you don't win and gain victory, and there are many reasons that we battle things. They're spiritual and demonic. We're not going to talk about those this morning, but the Holy Spirit dropped something in my heart in this series of messages that I'm doing called Turn that I believe is going to help some people here this morning or help some people that are listening or will listen after the fact to this message. I'm going to start with a story this morning. I read it a couple of weeks ago as I was rereading material on the Holy Spirit because of preparing for a, um, a message series on the Holy Spirit. But this story just grabbed my attention, and it really is going to apply to one of my points here in a moment, so I'm going to read it to you now. Several years ago in one of the New England states, the wife of a Christian businessman, a friend of ours, was busy cleaning up the breakfast dishes when a knock came at the door. She opened it to see her neighbor standing there with a woebegone look on her face. Now, this was written several years ago. That's why it says woebegone. I've not heard anybody say that in the past decade, at least, but maybe they have <laughs> I just came over to say goodbye, the visitor announced. We've been neighbors for quite a while, and although we don't know one another very well, I just wanted to let you know that we're leaving. Why? Asked my friend's wife. Has your husband got a new job or what? Sit down, tell me about it. The neighbor dropped wearily in a chair. N no, she said nothing like that. We're losing the house. Can't make the payments. Losing the car, too, for that matter. She opened her hands, lying in her lap, and stared at them. Then she looked up, might as well tell you the whole story. John and I are getting a divorce. But why? What in the world has gone wrong? My husband and I are both hopeless alcoholics, said the woman sadly. Just can't seem to shake it. Money's all gone and everything else with it. What gets me the most is our child. I don't like to see him the victim of a broken home and all that. The little woman was nearly in tears. But, but said my friend's wife, don't you know there's an answer? And the neighbor looked up abruptly, what do you mean? We've tried everything we know. We can't just seem to stay on the program with AA. We've tried psychiatry, but even if that were a possible answer, we couldn't afford long-term counseling. Why don't you ask Jesus to help you? It was the neighbor's turn to look nonplushed. Jesus? What's he got to do with it? Why, he's the Savior, exclaimed my friend's wife. Oh, said the visiting neighbor, you mean religion and all that. Yeah, yeah, I'm religious. I mean, uh, I believe in God, and I've, I've tried to be a decent person, she laughed wryly. I guess I haven't done too good a job with that, though. No, 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 that's not what I mean. I mean, Jesus is a Savior. He saves, rescues people. He'll rescue you from your situation if you'll ask him to take over. You do want to get out of this, don't you? I mean, you want to be different to get things straightened out. The neighbor looked at her companion for a moment or two and never heard it put that way before, she said slowly. You mean it's that simple? Just ask him? My friend's wife nodded. Uh-huh, he's alive. He's right here. He'll do it. The neighbor sat for a moment or two in silence, then suddenly slipped out of the chair and onto her knees and lifted her hands in a gesture of surrender I don't know how to say this, she said, but Jesus, please help me out of this mess. Please take over. Then she stood up, and without further comment, she went home. Two days later, the husband came over from next door. What's happened to my wife, he asked gruffly. I want it too. This Christian couple told him, and he got down on his knees on the kitchen floor and asked Jesus to take over his life. What happened? The alcohol problem disappeared. 
It was only a symptom of their empty lives. The home was not lost. The marriage did not break up. Jesus saves. He saved their home, their marriage, their health, and probably their lives. The passage that we're going to look at again this morning is Luke chapter 3. And because it was in our regular Bible reading and has already been read, I'm not going to read it, but I do ask you to turn there, please, so that we can reference a couple of verses. This is really the beginning of Jesus' ministry. His forerunner was his cousin, John the Baptist. It happened in a very specific historical time. All of the names that are here, uh, Pontius Pilate, Herod Antipas, uh, Philip, all of these are historical figures. They all lived and ruled during a certain period of time. And John appears on the screen, uh, on the scene, and John is talking to the people of God, and he is being very confrontational. Verses uh, uh, 7 and 8, let's just take a look at these again. It says, when the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, you brood of snakes. Or you vipers. How did the NIV say it? Uh, you vipers. Um, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Just don't say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. John, as a prophet, is being very confrontational because God needed a confrontational voice at this time. He's being very confrontational. But the interesting thing is, even in his confrontation, people are flocking. That means there's a move of God. You don't come to someone who's going to point his finger in your face and go, you brood of vipers, who do you think you are to escape God's wrath if something's not happening? It's, just, it's my desire and my prayer that this nation, which still has a claim to Christianity, or at least a portion of it, would be willing to be confronted by God I hope that people within this congregation would be willing to be confronted by God if they need confrontation, because God will confront the people of God if they need it. But here's a point. I think it's in your notes coming up on the screen. God confronts for the purpose of bringing us comfort. Never feel that if you are being confronted by God, whether it's through a message that I preach, whether it's through your Bible reading, whether it's through the Holy Spirit himself, that you're feeling convicted, you're feeling confronted, you're feeling pushed back about something that God is trying to make you feel bad. He's not trying to make you feel bad, although you will feel bad, or you will feel badly is probably the best way to say it. If there's any English teachers out there, you can correct my grammar later. Because ultimately, he wants to bring you comfort. But the comfort will not come until you respond to the confrontation, till you respond to the conviction, till you move in that direction. God confronts us for the purpose of ultimately bringing us comfort. And that's what took place with John. When people responded to his preaching, they began to receive the peace and the comfort of God after they were water baptized. And they got really excited because they could sense that something spiritual was taking place. Something was shifting in the spiritual atmosphere and that God was moving. They were expecting Messiah who was going to appear very quickly. We're going to review quickly a couple of points and then we're going to move on to the heart of what i believe the holy spirit would have for us today first thing is this what does it mean to repent what does it mean to repent on the screen repent is a change of mind which leads to a change in your actions or a change of actions it's a change of mind look at what matthew 3 1 and 2 says and this is also john the baptist from the amplified in those days john the baptist appeared preaching in the wilderness of Judea along the western side of the Dead Sea and saying, repent. And now the Amplified gives us a big definition of what he was talking about. What does repent mean? Repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking. That's where that change of mind comes from. It's a change in your thinking. Repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Regret past sins. Live your life in a way that proves repentance. Seek God's purpose for your life, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Sorrow alone does not produce repentance. Sorrow can lead to repentance. Godly sorrow can lead to repentance, but some people are sorry for their sins, but it doesn't lead them to repentance. But because they were sorry for their sins, they feel that everything is fine. No, repentance is this change of mind, change of thinking, which leads to a change in our action and a change in our life. Now, repentance is a two-step process, and that's why I've entitled the message turn or turn from and turn to repentance is a two-step process you turn from something and turn to something you're going to turn from your old way of living your old way of thinking your old way of doing things and you're going to turn to god or god's way and when you turn from in your mind when you begin to look at the world when you begin to look at circumstances when you begin to look at your attitudes when you begin to look at your life when you begin to look at your behaviors and realize that they don't line up with what God in his word says, you turn from that in your mind and you turn to God's way of doing things, your behaviors will follow. Maybe. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Why? Sometimes. Because some of you have turned to God. But you're still wrestling with things. And so this morning, I'm going to talk very practically about how we can apply this turning from and turning to. So if you have your bulletin, which has a note section, and you want to write some things down, uh, there are some blanks in there. The first thing is this. To turn from something without turning to leaves you powerless to change. To try to turn from your old way of thinking, your old life, without turning to God means you're not going to have the power to change. This is why I told you that story. I read the story from the book. Here was a couple that tried to turn from their alcoholism, that tried to turn from a lifestyle that was falling apart, heading towards divorce, heading towards the loss of a home, heading towards the loss of a car. They were losing everything that they valued, including the possibility that their child would be a child of divorce. They were trying to turn from something but didn't have the power to do it. But when they turn to Jesus, things began to fall away. I love this story because that's one of the stories of how someone, and it was a miraculous, instantaneous, short-term change where they began to get on top of this alcohol and their lives were saved. It doesn't always happen that way, but it does because of the power of God. But if the power of God is with you, if you've turned from and you're turning to, God is there with you. I've heard other stories where people say, I've turned to God and I prayed and I worked and I fasted and I kept on and it kept on and I kept on and I kept on and finally the victory came. There are going to be a lot of reasons. But to turn from something or to attempt to turn from something. Now, with, with your will, with your determination, there's a lot of things we can accomplish. I am not going to say that there are people who don't... Uh, Come, uh, don't overcome alcoholism or drug addiction through, through self-will. You can, you can go so far, but the true victory and living the way that God wants is going to require us to also turn to, to turn to God and not be powerless to change. Now, I'm going to make a small aside here. I want to read something here because I don't know if anybody needs to hear this, but somebody might. John, uh, in verse 15, follow along if you're there. He's talking about, you know, what they need to do, turning from, turning to, and, and next week we're going to talk about what this all looks like. But this week, in verse 15, it says, Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to, eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their question saying, uh, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So John's telling him, I'm not this Messiah, but I'm ahead of him. He is coming. But here's what I want you to see, what John said. I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave or untie the straps of his sandals. Here it is. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Some of you need the power that comes by being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I don't have time, and I'm not going to preach on it. I am going to preach on it. But for someone today, 
one of the things that you need in your life, if you've not received it, is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, Pastor, what is that all about? And how can I find out about it? Go to our church website. And we always leave it on, I think it's the, uh, the, the page of resources. There is a seven-part series that I have done on the baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues, and all those things. I'm not going to be preaching this now. I will be preaching it sometime this year. Not that series, but a different one. But if you want to know about it, if you want to know about the power of God that is available to every single born-again follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is going to, it, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power. Have you turned to the things of God? Have you changed your mind? Somebody here, maybe somebody here, maybe somebody listening, maybe I'm just making it up, but you were told in a previous church that this stuff is all gone. It's, it's done away with. This speaking in tongues stuff, that was only for the first century, and so you've got to turn from that old thinking if you're going to receive the power of God because you've got to turn to what the Scripture says, what it declares, that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for today. It is for now speaking in tongues is available i did it this morning i did it up here on the platform during worship i know hopefully i wasn't too loud but it's your breath in my lungs so i pour out my praise and i chose for a moment there and 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 i and i praised him in a language that i don't understand have you turned to God, have you turned to the power? Okay, that's all you're going to get on, at least I think that's all you're going to get on the baptism of the Holy Spirit right now. Okay. Point two this morning, and this is where I'm going to land. To turn to God without turning from your old life leaves you in a battle. How many born-again people do you know that still battle. Hey, businessman, businesswoman, salesman, saleswoman, do you cut corners? Do you make promises you know you're not going to be able to fulfill in the time frame so that you can close that deal? So you've turned to God, but have you turned from those business practices? Single adult or married adult, you've turned to God, but does your eye like to go towards and your imagination like to imagine? Because if you turn to God, but you don't turn from your life is going to be in a battle. You will never have full peace. You will never have full power. You will be torn. You cannot turn. Now, I'm not saying you can't turn to God and still go to heaven. This isn't about going to heaven. We are saved by grace. But this is walking in victory. Remember I asked about maybe there's an area of your life that you still battle, have been battling, can't seem to get over the top of? You've turned to God, but have you turned from? I've known people over the years, I don't know if there's anybody sitting here that's like this, but they've turned to God, but they haven't turned from the fact that they really like to sleep in on Sundays and really don't follow what the Scripture says about gathering together with the saints. And gosh, there's a ball game that's starting at 11 o'clock. And we used to have this in Central Time Zone a lot. Uh, Eastern Time is so much better. Eastern Time is so much better for church attendance. But, you know, when the Colts played at noon, not the Colts, um, when the Chiefs played at noon, Ooh, that really could affect church attendance, especially in the Kansas City area if you're going to the stadium. I mean, let's just face it. And I'm not saying that you can't do that, but, but how many people have turned to God but haven't turned from what they love to do on the weekend? Am I saying they're not going to heaven? No, I'm not saying they're not going to heaven. I'm just saying that they're going to be in a battle. Because the Word of God tells us some things as to what it is like to change our mind about what's important. You know, there's some people that are in a battle right now because you spend 50 times more time 
on your screen, on your device, than you do in God's Word. Jesus said, man shall not live by Facebook alone. And Instagram alone. And Snapchat alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Oh, but pastor, you know, I, 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 get on, I get on Etsy or I get on whatever, and I see all these wonderful plaques with scripture on it. Does that count? No, it does not. <laughs> That's my opinion. I don't know if it's Jesus' opinion. To turn to God without turning from your own life leaves you in a battle. And walking with Jesus requires a continually turning from and turning to. Some of you are trapped in patterns of living or patterns of sin that you don't want to turn from. And that's why. That's why you're not living in victory. And most of us will be thinking about this the way that I thought about it until yesterday morning when the Holy Spirit began to speak to me personally, truly personally, about working some things out in my life, but I'm going to share it with you also. Most of us think about this as our sinful activities. You know, what we do here, what we don't do, those type of things. This is where I believe that someone or ones are going to receive a word from God. I pray that you act upon it. Because here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. Okay. Your battle is not with sin. You are not locked into something in your life like lying or anger or purity issue. The battle that you are in is the battle of wanting to do things your way. The battle of having your own way. The battle that shows itself in your arrogance about things that others see, but we often don't, that our way is the best. God is and has been calling you to lay down an attitude, a preference, some feelings you are holding, thoughts that often come up in your mind about how other people are wrong, and God is saying you need to change the way you are approaching things because this new way or this new thing is my way. Some of you have been trapped and locked into things because you're still holding on to your preferences, your way of doing things, your way of relating, your way, your preferences, your attitudes. And it's come up against... Remember, we have to turn from. Now, not everything that we have as far as our way is bad, but there are some things, and we have to be aware of it. And we have to turn from that, a change of mind, which leads to a change of action, turn from, turn to. That's repentance also. your ways, your preferences, your attitudes. And I don't know. I'm not going to give you a whole list of what these could be. The Lord showed me at least one in my life, and I went, oh. See, because as, as a pastor, I have the ability to kind of set the way we do worship, set this, give direction here, give direction there, lead and Sometimes God is saying, well, well, Rick, that's your preference, but I'm, no, no, it worked when I was back in Marysville. Actually, it worked when I was back in Sharon Springs. Now, that goes way back. I said, no, this is just me now, okay, this is just me. New wine can't be put in old wineskins. I have to ask myself where I become an old wineskin. Because I'm not going to get any new wine. Why? Because God won't destroy me. He'll set me aside and let me sit in my old way. Some of you got set aside.
God's speaking to you today. I've actually prayed that he might drop things in some of your hearts. But I have to be cautious as a leader because I can, if I'm not careful, and I've been trying to be cautious for decades, and so I don't know that I'm here. In fact, the Lord didn't speak to me particularly about my leadership, but I had to think about how I could, I could hold back many people from everything that God wants because of my own preferences. And you say, well, how would, no, you wouldn't hold me back, Pastor. Listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to lift myself up, but the pastor of a church oftentimes has great respect he is the man who is seeking God, and congregations will follow. And if he's not willing to turn from and turn to, then he keeps the church here. And I made a decision a long time ago, I'm always going this direction, which means I have to turn from some things. And I've had to turn from a lot of things over the years. If I have my, okay, I'm just... This is me, okay? If I had my druthers, because these songs give me goosebumps, as a church, we'd still be singing I Exalt Thee. And I love I Exalt Thee. And occasionally, Nathaniel has brought it back on a worship night, and guess who gets the goosebumps? I'd be singing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. My heart was so moved early in my Christian walk because those were the songs. But those songs are gone. It was kind of funny when I was thinking about praise this morning, and again, maybe this was for me. I kind of felt the Holy Spirit say, you know, some of us, when we get to heaven, I don't know if this is of God or not, if it's just my wild imagination. Um, I had a I had a pastry this morning. It was a crumble coffee cake type of thing. And pastries and caffeine can really send my imagination. So this may just be my imagination. but <laughs> I think God is in heaven is going to place us in the place of the music we like the least to show us that it's true worship. And he's going to put me in bluegrass and... Um, <laughs> And what it, dulcimer, <gasps> dulcimer, oh, gross. I, I expect that's probably what's going to happen because I've complained so much about dulcimer music. I go down to uh, the Ozark Silver Dollar City, and there's these people that are like falling out in the spirit with the dulcimer, and all I'm doing is gagging, you know. <laughs> How can anybody worship God off the dulcimer? Oh, my goodness. I hope he doesn't keep me there more than 10,000 years. <laughs> puts, me, puts me in the old charismatic, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Or, I'll tell you what, I've got to be cautious as a leader. But we have to be cautious as people. That we don't miss God because of our preference. That's the way I felt the Holy Spirit wanted to, me to say this morning. Someone here has been through several marriages and the relationship you're in now is suffering because you won't turn from your old way of doing things. You think the way that you relate is right. You've turned to God, you're a believer. You've asked for his help. But the answer is to turn and to learn a new way relating. I want to ask you, and I think this would be a good time for the team to gather. Okay. Here's the question. Everybody paying attention now. I've asked myself this, and this is where I got my revelation yesterday as God was putting this in my heart. Where does it feel like you have regular frustration in your life? Where does it feel like you have regular frustration in your life? Where you are continually dealing with unhappiness?
Is it possible? That you need to turn from something and turn to something else. Now, not every area of frustration falls into this category. But what I have prayed is that the Holy Spirit would show each of us if there's an area that he has been pointing out and is pointing out. And here's what I would like you to do. I'd like each of us to ask God to show us a place. Or if you're already aware of a place where you're continually frustrated or continually unhappy, to ask him, is this a place where I need to turn from something and turn to a different way of thinking and doing that is honoring to him? Would you bow your heads? Lord, this morning, most, if not all of us here are believers. And turning to you is not, turning more to you is not the answer. The answer is turning from something. So God, we give you permission to show us if there is a place that we have been unwilling to turn from something. Whether that's an area of of, of sin, our old life, whether it's an old attitude, some preferences, some habits, or the way we just like things to be. Lord, show us where this might be so that we can lay it down. Now, Lord, as I take just a few seconds, speak to hearts this morning. we can trust that when you confront your ultimate goal, the ultimate destination is for our comfort, for us to finally move out of the battle. So Lord Jesus, this morning, as you speak to your children, help us. Help us to see We need to lay down what we need to from to turn from so that we can turn to you fully. You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you are not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.